This is Chad. He's an expert. This is me. I am not an expert. Listen to Chad. Well, let's do this. Um, yeah. I have, a, I have a, quite a few things I want to talk to you about. But first of all, why don't you, um, why don't you introduce yourself and tell, tell everybody what you do for Read Mariculture? Yeah, so uh, my name is Chad Clayton. I work for Reed Mariculture. We make uh, a product line called Reef Nutrition and another one for aquaculture called Instant Algae. Uh, and I am invo I'm involved in uh, quite a few aspects here at the farm. Uh, primarily, uh, when I came on about 12 years ago, I was brought on to grow copepods for the company uh, because we saw a future for copepods, not just in the hobby, but also in aquaculture. Uh, and I've had, I have a lot of experience in aquaculture. I've worked for oceans, reefs, and aquariums, uh, breeding clownfish and, and a number of marine ornamentals. I worked out in Hawaii doing food fish. And so a lot of those jobs required live feed organisms. Uh, and so I got a lot of experience with that and, and came to work for the reeds. And 12 years later, we have uh, three different species of copepods that we supply into, the, into aquaculture and the reef aquarium hobby. Uh, and and uh, I've I've had a lot to do with that, uh, and so it's been it's been quite a journey, a lot of research and experimentation and stuff like that, which I enjoy a lot. Uh, and I also do our social media. I do a lot of our trade shows. I do educational presentations, uh, and and I also am in charge of our biosecurity plan here at the farm. Uh, and so um, I do wear many hats, and and today I'm wearing the interview presentation education hat. So. <laughs> Thanks for having me on. <laughs> hey, thank you. So I was talking to a mutual friend of ours who who's going to re remain nameless, and she wanted me to ask you a couple questions. And the, and the first one was, uh, is, it, is it true that you make your colleagues call you the Copa God? <laughs> I do not make anybody call me the Copa God. That was, a, that was purely a joke. I have no God <laughs> complex. I just go Copa Pods, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, and then it just kind of spiraled out of control and there were all kinds of memes and stuff and, and it's been fun, you know, the pod father and yeah. Ooh, I like that know, one. father of pods and whatever. <laughs> okay, and then uh, the other question, which I hear is your absolute favorite question. Recently, you sent 200,000 pods to my friend Darren at, uh, at Rogue Aquarium. And I hear this is just, you love explaining this. It's like, I mean, come on. You're just guessing, right? 200,000 pods, that's a total guess. No, no. We, uh, we use science uh, to quantify our life feed organisms. This is something that people in aquaculture and in research and in science have been doing for decades. So basically, I, t I take a known volume of in a container. So let's, let's say I'm going to count my animals. I'm going to put them in two liters of water. So two liters of water contains 2,000 milliliters and this is all metric stuff. I, we only use metric here because it's way easier to work with. Uh, and, and what I do is, uh, you know, I add the pods to that volume. I know what I have. I take a one milliliter sample out of that volume. I put them under a scope and I use vinegar to fix them so that they're not moving around. It's a lot easier to count them when they're not moving. Uh, and so I count every single animal in that one milliliter. Hmm. Then I take that number and multiply it times 2000. And that's how I get my quantity. And then from there, I can do math on, you know, if I needed 200,000 out of that quantity, I can do some simple math to to get what I need out of that volume of water. Uh, so it super is simple stuff. And you can you can get it done. And this kind of thing can be done in minutes. And, and yeah, it's always, it's always interesting to, to hear people say, you didn't really count all those. No way. No way. <laughs> and no, I don't count them all individually. We take we what we do is we take a sub sample. So, yeah, that's what we okay. do. All right. So today's topic. Now, you have to remember, you're you're talking to me and my audience is beginners. And I remember the last time we chatted, you dropped a butt ton of science on me and it just went way over my head. All right. So you're going to have to dumb it down for me today, but we want to talk about refugiums, why they're good, how to set them up, different kinds of pods, so on and so forth. Um, so maybe let's start with why should somebody, a beginner, consider setting up a refugium? What are what are the benefits of setting up a refugium in their in their tank? You know, one of the one of the primary benefits that I've noticed in the hobby over the years, and what people prefer to do when setting up a, a refugium, is to is to house uh, things like macroalgae uh, in the refugium. Uh, you know, this is a live like it's like a plant basically, and so macroalgae it, it acts as a natural filter. Uh, it will, uh, you know, it will uh, strip out nitrogenous waste, so nitrate, nitrite, ammonia, uh, and they also pull out phosphates out of the water, and they use these compounds to grow. Uh, and so, a lot of people use refugiums to 
refugia, you know, plural <laughs> refugia, um, to to uh, to house these these macroalgae so that they're not, you know, drifting around in the reef tank. They're not getting eaten by herbivores, uh, and and they act as a filter. And so as the macroalgae grows, you can you can trim it. You know, you can cut the biomass in half. Remove the macroalgae, you know, toss it in the garbage, toss it in your garden, let it decompose and, and the nutrients settle into your soil. Some people will do that. Uh, and then the macroalgae continues to grow and absorb nutrients and, and you know, rinse and repeat, so to speak. Uh, and and uh, along those lines, you know, macroalgae is, is a great habitat for organisms like copepods. And so it's, you know, it, it, it came to be that a lot of people started putting uh, copepods into yeah. their refugiums. Or, or rock, live rock that had hitchhikers. So other zooplankton organisms like amphipods and isopods uh, and, and you know, a lot of these other organisms that exist inside of reef rock that are kind of ubiquitous in this hobby. You, know, you can find them everywhere. Uh, and, and so the refugium came not, j just wasn't just this place where you, know, you could grow macroalgae and, and you know, kind of clean up your tank a little bit and absorb nutrients, but it also became this, this, this amazing habitat for these animals. Uh, and, and the refugium, it, you know, it, it provides a place for these zooplankton animals to, to thrive, to breed, to populate without the threat of predation from fish. Because, uh, you know, a lot of fish will eat zooplankton, not just mandarins, not just seahorses and pipefish, uh, you know, wrasses. I've seen clownfish eat them, chromis, dottybacks, you name it. A lot of things eat these animals. Uh, they're one of the most abundant animals on the planet. Uh, and and they, they contain a, a very good source of nutrition. Copepods eat phytoplankton. They gain a lot of nutrition from the phytoplankton. So we're talking, you know, basic stuff like proteins, fatty acids, you know, lipids, fats. Um, and all of these things are, are produced by the algae. The algae gets consumed by the zooplankton. Uh, you know, in this case, we'll say a copepod. The copepod assimilates a lot of the nutrition into its body. And in fact, it can change some of that nutritional, uh, the, the nutrition uh, compounds and, and upgrade them, so to speak. And then when a fish eats it, it gains all that nutrition. Um, and a lot of that stuff that, that the algae produces, um, it, it, it only, it's only produced by algae. You know, zooplankton don't produce certain things like pigments and, and chlorophyll. So that comes from the algae and it gets passed on through the copepod to the, to the consuming organism, a coral or fish. Uh, and, and so, yeah, the, um, the refugium is a great place to, you know, kick, to, to get a very strong zooplankton population going. If you've got macroalgae, that's that's awesome. It provides a great habitat for them, um, and it, and you know it's it's just a great place to have you know other organisms. Some people will put sponges in their refugium to absorb nutrient. You know it's it's kind of like a filter. It's right. it's like a living filter. It's really cool to be able to do that. And then you get to learn about macroalgae. You get to learn about zooplankton. Uh, you get to ask questions about these things. And so so yeah, that's it, you know it, these it, refugium has evolved you know over the past twenty years. Um, and so, yeah, it's really cool okay. to see, see where it's going. Yeah. So, so if, if you were talking to beginner and they're like, I want to set up my first refugium and I want to stock it with your pods, you know, do you have any recommendations for a simple setup of like the things they should buy in order to have success? Right. Yeah. So, um, basically what you want to do is if you have a brand new tank, you don't want to add any pods right off the bat. You want to let the tank cycle a little bit, even if you're adding bacteria, you want to let, you know, you want to let things like algae, there's certain, you know, species of algae that, that come along as you're cycling a tank, as a tank is growing and aging. And we all know this, you know, these, this brown stuff that grows on the rocks, there's green stuff that grows on the rocks. This is all microalgae. Once you start seeing that, then, then you can start thinking about adding zooplankton because a lot of that microalgae that we consider a nuisance or just a natural part of the cycling of the tank um, is, is actually food for these organisms, they will eat diatoms, they will eat blue-green algae. Uh, copepods are known to eat cyano and dinoflagellates. It's, it's remarkable. They, they, they have a very strong ability to adapt to these scenarios yeah. where you know diet may be limiting or it's a, not a normal diet. They'll just do what they can to make it. They'll even eat bacteria. Uh, and and so, so as a beginner, what you want to do is wait to see some of that algae growing in the tank and a refugium needs habitat. You know, it can't just be a bare tank with nothing in it. Uh, you, you most certainly need habitat. So good habitat options are macroalgae, live macroalgae. Uh, Ketomorpha is a very popular one. Um, and it's, it's just a green macroalgae. Uh, some people use the Gracilaria algae species that are out there. That's a genus of, of macroalgae. Uh, Gracilaria is found um, in many places in the, uh, in, in the world. 
Uh, and and there are some other there are some other ones out there. A lot of people are working with macroalgae these days, so there are some interesting options. Uh, it obviously it helps to have a light over the refugium, and some people will do uh, you know twelve hours on, twelve hours off, uh, and and you know give the give the macroalgae plenty of light to to grow. Um, and then and then as far as other habitat, there's artificial structures that you can put in there. You know the the what you want to do is you want to pay attention to a porous type of artificial okay. structure. So rocks even if it even if they're artificial rocks or if they're rocks that came off of a reef or you know out of the ocean that were bleached as long as they're very porous and they provide a lot of surface area for those animals to get inside of right. reproduce you know their babies can grow in there the the copepod larvae can grow in there uh and and it also just provides you know a really cool habitat for them and they can get in there and eat detritus eat waste uh waste um things like that or organic waste uh, and, and so those, you know, and then, and then obviously adding the copepods and we sell a couple of species that people use in their reef aquariums. Um, we spell, we sell a species called Tigriopus californicus. It's, it's primarily from the West coast of North America, from Alaska, all the way down to California, uh, Baja, California, down in Mexico. Um, we've been growing those for about 12 years now. And a lot of people feed them to mandarins and dragonets and, and have had success keeping those animals long-term thanks to live feed organisms that are supplied by us. Uh, tig Tigriopus are a good one. Tigger, we call them Tigger pods. That's our registered trademark. Um, and then the apex pods, the Apocyclops panamensis, which is a cyclopoid copepod. This is a different order of copepods in, you know, in the taxonomic scheme. Um, they are found all throughout the equator, the tropical zones in the Gulf of Mexico, the Atlantic Ocean, from like Brazil all the way up to the Carolinas, Everglades, you name it, they're everywhere. Uh, and and they are a very hardy species and and one that is much smaller than tigger pods and they reproduce faster. So it's always good to to get in a variety of these of these copepods and and you know over the course of of the years we've had customers ask us can you provide us more copepod variety uh, and 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 you know it, it helps to increase zooplankton biodiversity. And so getting multiple species of copepods into the refugium is is great. And then those animals will eventually make their way up into the display tank and there's some uh, you know different methods for doing that so then those two pods the ticker pods and the Ar what's it called the arctic pods is that what they are um apex pods apex, sorry the apex and the ticker pods can they live together will will like one consume the other oh. or can they live happily in a refugium so, together so zooplankton are they do uh, compete against each other for food and habitat and they will absolutely eat each other's you know larvae because you know a copepod larvae hatches out very small. It's they're almost microscopic in some some copepod species, uh, and they go through twelve different stages of development. So you can imagine that they're very fragile when they're very small and they don't have the ability to to eat you know larger things. They can only eat you know mi microalgae and very small particular organic waste. Uh, and so copepods will eat each other. They will compete against each other. They will cannibalize their young. And to mitigate these things. It's all about habitat and food um, and, and, you know, a lot of habitat, a lot of surface area, a lot of places for them to get in and live in, uh, and, and, you know, as well as providing food and not just what's growing naturally in the re in the refugium, because you will have mac microalgae growing in the refugium. You'll have organic waste, bacteria, but it's also good to supplement their diet with more phytoplankton, uh, you know, you know, such as um, the, the different species that we produce that we sell into aquaculture in the hobby, which is exactly the same stuff that we feed them here. We grow them with phytoplankton. It's, it's the best possible thing that we can feed them. So yeah, those are, those are two ways, those are some ways to mitigate all of that competition, all of you know, them eating each other. So, so I don't need a, a huge explanation here, but, but how long is the average life cycle of like one of your pods? Are we talking a few days? Are we talking a month? Like how long do they live? So tigger pods, so when they hatch, uh, it takes them about three to four weeks, and this is temperature dependent. Uh, they grow much faster when it's warmer. Um, so it takes them about three to four weeks to, to get to sexual maturity. And basically they go through 12 different stages of development, then they hit their adult stage and that's it. They stop growing. They don't continue to molt like a lobster or a crab or shrimp. You know, they're all related. They're all crustaceans. Um, and, and so then from there, they live for three to four more months, uh, which, you know, it can, is a quite a yeah, long, um, is a long time. <laughs> yeah, to, it's a long time for a pod to live. It's pretty amazing. Hmm. That's the tigger pod. So the apex pods, they can reach sexual maturity in about seven days. And, and of course, again, temperature and density dependent. Uh, and, and, uh, and then from there, you know, you're looking at maybe 80 more days 
uh, until until they reach senescence and they pass away. Um, and same thing with them; they go through multiple stages of development, reach sexual maturity, and boom, that's you know how they, they live their life at that size. Okay. Um, and so yeah, and then and then females only need one reproductive event; they only need to court once with a male. The male donates the sperm; she holds onto the sperm in small packets and then fertilizes her own eggs as she needs it. So oh, okay. she can live the rest of her life and make her own babies, oh, that's and that's cool. it. No more, no, you know, no marriage, no dating, none of that right. kind right. of thing. One, time. One and done. <laughs> yeah, it's exactly, yeah. And it's a great strategy because you can imagine if you're in a harsh environment and finding a, finding a mate can sometimes be hard to do. So when you find that mate, you get what you need, and, and then you can move on, and you don't need to spend the time and energy doing that all over again. Oh, interesting. Okay, so I was looking at, at, at the website, and I was reading everything about, about your two kinds of pods. But as a beginner, I was looking at them, and I was like, they say the exact same thing. So how do I know, as a beginner, which ones I should get and how much I should get? Yeah, they, no, that's always a tricky question. And, and in the end, it's always good to just get the variety, get, you know, get multiple species into your tank. Um, we, you know, the, the uses for copepods are very similar across the board. They're, they're food for animals. Uh, they're, you know, they're great for stocking a refugium. They uh, act almost as a cleanup crew. Um, it's, it's, they're not a, a significant, you know, they don't have a significant effect, you know, as like a bunch of snails and hermit crabs would, but they do act as a cleanup crew for sure. You know, they eat microalgae, they eat organic waste, they help to break that stuff down so your skimmer can strip it out. Um, and 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 then and, and then the just the different the different sizes the different coloration you know, tigger pods are more red they're much larger than apex pods they're more conspicuous they pack more of a a, a carotenoid punch so they have more uh, pigmentation that they can pass on to the consuming animal uh, and that pigmentation can enhance the the fish's pigmentation it also acts as an antioxidant uh, so the that you know you're getting a, a lot more nutrient from a tigger pod when you eat it versus an apex pod. Um, and apex pods are, since they're much smaller, they reproduce a lot faster. They actually have the potential to ha uh, set, you know, set up a long-term population and just keep on breeding. You know, it, but of course there are some factors that affect that. Right. Okay, so I have a 120 gallon system and I know you guys are gonna send me some pods and I have a refugium set up, you know, I'm ready to go. There's a good habitat there for a 120 gallon system. Is there some sort of ratio that I should be like, I should get this much to at least begin stocking the tank? Yeah, you know, this is a tricky, this is one of the hardest questions because, you know, uh, biologically all tanks are, are different. You know, everybody's got different bacterial populations and different, you know, zooplankton organisms and, and other critters. So things, things are wildly different from one 20 or 100 gallon tank to another. Um, and so if you have a refugium, yeah, uh, you know that's a much smaller space, uh, and and so you know typically refugium a refugium isn't more than like thirty gallons. That's you know it's pretty big for for somebody. Um, I know people that have just massive ones um, that are almost the same size as their display tank, um, which is amazing. Uh, and so you know typically you know if 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 you're looking at like a hundred gallons or less, um, you know one bottle of each would be fine of those animals. Especially, you know, and, and this is this is assuming you have no predators, you're starting off fresh, they, you know, they have, you know, a blank check, so to speak, they can just populate and go crazy. Uh, and, and if you're willing to wait and, you know, and be patient and see how they do, then yeah, you know, only a couple of bottles would be fine into the refugium. Yeah. Okay, so, so I get my shipment, I have everything set up, they arrive in the mail. Um, do I need to do anything special to introduce them? Turn off the pumps? Uh, acclimate? I mean, what do I have to do? Yeah, so so it, it so we ship all of our copepods cold, uh, and that just slows them down metabolically. They don't consume all the oxygen in the in the bottle in the very small volume of water that we put them in, uh, and and so they come to you cold, or you buy them from a, a fish store. The tigger pods are kept in in the in the refrigerator. Apex pods are actually kept at room temperature because they don't tolerate refrigeration, uh, and and so yeah, you're gonna you're gonna allow them to warm up. You do not need to float them in the in the tank like you would a fish or a coral to temperature acclimate. You don't need to do that. You can just simply set them, uh, you know, near the tank or on a counter somewhere with the caps. You can just take off the cap completely or pop the cap, and that just allows for gas exchange. Uh, you know, so they get oxygen, and then after they warm up, and this, you know, this this doesn't take that long. Maybe an hour, uh, you know, maybe a couple hours, uh, and then and then so then adding them. And so there's a couple of strategies here. So if you're just adding them to refugium, you can add them at any time of day. 
You don't need to turn anything off because, you know, typically a, a review gym is a very calm environment. There's no fish in there, no predators, nothing that's going to wipe them out instantly. Uh, and so adding them to a review gym, you can do that any time of day. Uh, adding them to a display tank without fish, uh, you can do during, during with, with lights on, just, just turn off all the pumps because you don't want the pods getting whipped around the tank and, you know, bashed from one end to the other uh, or just sent over the overflow and, you know, caught into your filtration and, and just, you know, just tumbling them around. You don't want to do that. What you want to do is you turn off the pumps, uh, put them in. And some people will actually take uh, target feeding devices and inject them into their reef rock, into the substrate, oh. um, you know, get them right in there. Uh, I know some people that will actually submerge the bottle and stick it right into the rock and the pods just crawl out of the bottle right into the rock. Uh, and so those are a couple of strategies. So, so at, yeah, so that's, those, those are a couple of ways to add them without predators. Uh, but if you do have fish in your tank, you already have an established tank, you got, you know, tons of reef rock. What you want to do is wait till the lights are out. You're also going to turn off the pumps uh, and then, and you're going to add them in, wait about 30 minutes. This gives them a chance to settle in. Uh, and then you can turn your pumps back on. And by the next morning, they, they should be settled in and your fish can start hunting them down. So. Okay. All right, so we we have the pods in, we've introduced them, and now we want them to thrive. We want them to reproduce because we don't want to necessarily have to get a new shipment every week. You know, we like to be able to make as much as we can. So, so how do we make sure that they have long term success? Yeah, it, you know, it really helps to have a refugium for long term success of zooplankton. Um, a refugium is a, is a great place to feed those organisms. So, to to really get them to populate better, to do better. You just need to feed them more. Okay. They do really well if they're fed a lot of phytoplankton. So what a lot of our customers do is they use our phyto feast, which is our six species blend of phytoplankton, the most concentrated on the market. Uh, and what they'll do is they'll feed the refugium instead of the display. So we have a, we have a, uh, uh, directions for, for feeding the tank itself. And we have directions for feeding the refugium. Now, what happens when you feed the refugium is that the, the zooplankton in there are getting a much more concentrated dose than they would if you're feeding them in the, in the display. Uh, and so they're getting, they're, they have a lot more algae just drifting around so that they can grab onto it, consume it, bring it in and eat it. Um, and, and it lingers there for, you know, for quite mm -hmm. some time if the refugium isn't turning over rapidly per hour. Uh, and and so, so that's one of the best ways to feed your pod population. Uh, and, and by far the best way to keep pods is to have a refugium. Okay. Um, and then they make their way up into, into the display. And then what happens is the phytoplankton is small enough. You know, we're talking smaller than blood cells. Um, this stuff is so small that it can be pushed through a pump. No problem. The shear forces on a microscopic algae cell are nowhere near the same as if a fish gets pumped through it or a coral polyp. Way different um, physics involved. And, and the fluid dynamics are much different for algae being pumped. So the algae gets eaten by the zooplankton, it's concentrated in the refugium, then it makes its way into the display tank. The zooplankton up in there get to eat it. All of your filter feeders, your corals will eat it, and, and you've, you've, you ended up feeding everybody. Um, and so, so that's, that, that's a very good strategy for feeding zooplankton and, and trying to get them to populate as best you okay. can. Yeah. So we're talking a, a once a day sort of feeding? Yes, it is, it is, it is most valuable to feed small amounts multiple times a day. And I know people that will take, you know, we recommend one teaspoon per hundred gallons. They'll take that and cut it in half and do a half a okay. teaspoon in the morning, half a teaspoon in the, in the evening. And then that way, you know, there, it's not just one single feeding and then the algae is, you know, all consumed within four or five hours. And then there's nothing else until you get to them the next day. Okay. Uh, and, and so that's, yeah, that's the best way to do it. That's how we grow copepods. We feed them small amounts of algae multiple times a day. Do you guys do it by hand or, 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 or do you automate the process? We, 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 we have automated the process. Okay. Yeah. We have refrigerators that keep the algae, uh, uh, you know, stable. And then we have dosing pumps that dose the algae to our systems Perfect. every hour. So you guys sell, I know two different kinds of, of Fido. One, one that's maybe oh, you can explain, but my understanding is like one is live and one is not. Can you explain the difference and like which one is better or should a beginner even worry about it? Yeah, I you know the so you don't need to feed live algae to zooplankton. Um, they they don't care if it's alive or not. Uh, you know they'll eat rotting organic waste. Um, the, you know the ones that we work with. There are some copepods that are pelagic that are very picky, um, but those aren't the ones that you know you would add to a reef tank because they're pelagic. Um, and so 
So phytofeast, our phytofeast concentrate, which is, is essentially dead algae cells. The cells are no longer viable. They're not going through cellular fission and replicating themselves, but the cells are fully intact. So the cell wall is intact. All the nutritional qualities, all those elements that are inside that cell while it was alive are exactly as they were when it was alive. So when it when a coral consumes it, or you know an oyster or a copepod consumes that algae cell, it gets all the nutrition that it would have if the if the cell was alive, um, and and so what that means is we're able to pack way more algae into a bottle of phytofeast concentrate, the dead algae, than we can into phytofeast live, um, and so. Basically, you know, people feed dead things to their corals all day long. There's powdered foods out there. There's all kinds of stuff out there that's dead. The corals could care less if it's alive or dead, you know, if you're feeding zooplankton and corals. Um, as far as live phytoplankton goes, there are people that have told us, and this, there's, no, there's no data, no science behind this, no one size fits all, but there are people that have told us that when they add live phytoplankton to their tank, it, it helps to clean it up. It helps to absorb nutrient, you know, nitrogenous waste, nitrate, nitrite, and phosphates. Uh, and and that, that is totally believable. This is what algae does. Mm -hmm. um, and if the algae is in your tank long enough and it's alive, of course it's going to soak up those things. The one thing to keep in mind is that those, those ni the, the nitrogenous waste and the phosphate and the nitrate, things like that, they don't just suddenly disappear. They're, they're still in your tank. Yeah. They're inside the algae cell. So when the algae cell dies or right. gets eaten, that stuff is still in your tank. Yeah. So what you need to do is when you're when you're thinking about those things, you know, or when you're when you're thinking about adding live phytoplankton for that purpose, you know, as for for like to bioremediate your tank to be like a filtration, mm. like a natural filtration, you've got to remember that you need to get that algae out of there after it, you know, consumes a lot of those uh, excess nutrients. And you know, skimmers are one way to do it. Some right. people will use a UV um, UV uh, bulb, and that'll nuke the algae, and then the skimmer will just strip it out. Okay. Um, and and so yeah, that's the that's the only thing that live algae really is good for. A lot of people say that live algae creates less waste, uh, but that's not the case. I mean, it's still you know there's still algae in the tank. All the nutrient inside the algae is still in your tank. It hasn't magically disappeared. Um, and and so that you know those are just some some of the differences that that we you know we hear from hobbyists about live versus non live. Right. Uh, versus dead. Um, and in the end, um, our, our live phytoplankton, it, it has a viability of only three months if kept refrigerated. After okay. three months, the algae is no longer alive, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's rotting and spoiled and, and you got to throw it away. You can still continue to feed it because, like I said, the animals don't care if it's alive or not. Yeah. Um, and then as far as the phytofeast concentrate goes, you're looking at nine months shelf life. Uh, and, and, you know, this is refrigeration and that's a long time to have algae in the refrigerator mm -hmm. and, and, you know, nobody else is able to do that. So it's very convenient for people to buy a six ounce, 16 ounce, 32 ounce bottle and keep yeah. it for nine months. If you only have to buy it once a year, that's pretty awesome. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and you only need to use a little bit of our stuff because it's incredibly concentrated. So, hmm. so okay. yeah, those, those are some of the differences. Yeah. And you guys sell at local fish stores. Do you also sell online direct to consumer? Yes. Yeah. So okay. we we have always sold direct to consumer through our um, our online store. Uh, you know, there there are a number of people that don't have the local fish stores near them that carry our products. We're, we're not in PetSmart. You know, we're not in Petco. We're not in Walmart. Yeah. Um, and and you know, not every store carries these kinds of you know these, these kinds of premium foods. You know, a lot of stores just stock you know flake foods and pellets like and foods. some frozen stuff. Yeah, frozen exactly. Um, and and. And, uh, and so, yeah, a lot of retail stores carry our stuff and we actually have a store locator on our website to help guide you to find somebody. Okay. Um, a couple more questions. Uh, if I am a beginner and I put some pods in a refugium, but I don't have any plants in there, do the pods need light or can they, can they just live in darkness? They, yeah, they don't need light. Yeah. Okay. We don't, okay. we don't use direct light, uh, to grow our copa pods. We're, we're basically growing them in greenhouses. Uh, oh, so. Great. We, you know, we don't really have climate control. We have shade cloth, things like that. But, okay. but yeah, I like the apex pods. I don't, I don't use direct light on them at all. Okay. This tank back here, I never stocked it. Um, but of course things come in as, as hitchhikers and I have gigantic looking what I think are like amphipods all over mm -hmm. the place. Right. Can it, can amphipods and the copepods live together or are the amphipods is going to eat the copepods? It's, you know, they, they will, amphipods are known to eat 
eat copepods. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. Um, and it just, it, again, it comes down to habitat. Um, and, you know, amphipods prefer to be on surfaces in rock. They don't like to crawl around in the glass because uh, they'll just get picked off. Um, and, and, and so copepods will, you know, they, they will live in, in many different parts of your tank. They'll live on the glass. They'll live in the substrate. They'll live in the rock. They'll live in the yeah. filters. They'll live all over the place. Uh, and, and there is something to keep in mind with, with these zooplankton organisms is that there is an ebb and there is a flow to their population. You will see, you'll suddenly see tons of amphipods and then there, you know, suddenly there's, there's not a lot of them and amphipods will cannibalize each other uh, also. Okay. Um, and, and same with isopods, these little ant, they look like little ants uh, and they, their populations ebb and flow. So, um, so yeah, those are some things that, that happen just to zooplankton populations in general. Is there a reason that your company only uh, cultures copepods and not other types of pods? You know, there, there isn't a really good reason. I know we, we decided to work with copepods because of their use in aquaculture, as well as the hobby. We like to work with products that live in both worlds. Uh, and, and so as far as amphipods go, they're a little bit more difficult to work with because they're highly cannibalistic. They require a lot of habitat. They get much bigger. You can't really house them in high density. I mean, it's something that we could do for sure. I could totally grow amphipods. I could grow isopods. I could grow a number of copepods. I mean, we I have algae basically on tap here. We're talking over a million gallons of phytoplankton that I have at my fingertips, multiple species. Uh, and th the only reason why we don't do all those things is because, quite frankly, we don't have the space and we don't have, it, it, it doesn't fit really into our biosecurity plan um, because we try to compartmentalize all of our growing areas, you yeah. know? And so every, every growing area where there's, where we have, where we have rotifers or copepods, they are basically autonomous. They have their own equipment. Right. There's one person that takes care of them. Nobody is allowed to go in there. Uh, and, and, you know, we take it, we take contamination threat very seriously. Yeah. And so to continue to add more copepod species, it, it, it raises the threat of, of cross contamination for right, us. Right. So we have to move very slowly and it has to, you know, it has to make sense. If we're going amphipods and we sell a couple bottles a week, that doesn't make any sense. Um, <laughs> and, and, it, and it certainly doesn't make sense to us as a threat, a contamination threat. Um, because it, you know, it's amph if amphipods get into our tigger pod oh. system or our rotifer system, we're gonna have to nuke stuff right. and start over. And that's when Chad doesn't isn't happy, <laughs> you know. Even, even even when when our rotifers get into our tigger pod cultures, it is it's like you're pulling your hair out. You're you're incredibly frustrated because yeah. we cannot grow them together. They're yeah. they're two completely different organisms. Um, and so so yeah, those are some of the things that actually limit our our ability to to do all of these other things that I would absolutely love to do. So yeah, okay. Well, that's cool. I mean that. I know I, I learned a ton and thank you for not using all of that scientific jargon. I could tell at times you really wanted to, but then you were thinking, no, 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 no. I'm just going to use simple <laughs> words here. So I appreciate yeah, that. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Is, is there anything else for a beginner audience that they should know about, about pods or setting up a refugium, any tips or tricks or any, anything else? Well, you know, I think, I think we've covered it. Uh, you know, a lot of people are, are also concerned about salinity and these, mm. these animals that we work with, the tigger pods and apex pods, are both what we call in science urihaline, which means they can tolerate a wide range of salinities. Uh, and so this isn't like, you know, some of the corals that you find that are very, you know, the salinity range is very strict. They do best in one tiny salinity range. This is not the case with these copepods. Um, and in fact, this is a fun fact. I've actually taken our tigger pods, put them into fresh water, and they've survived for about 30 minutes and then you put them back into salt water and they, they perk right back up and there's zero mortalities. It is That's unbelievable. Amazing. I can't do that with the apex pods, but with the tigger pods, absolutely. And so if, if your salinity doesn't match, if you know, if you're really paranoid, you're testing the salinity in our bottles and it doesn't match your aquarium, that's totally fine. Don't worry about it. Um, and, and, and also temperature isn't really that big of a thing. You know, if you, if you can just acclimate the bottles up to room temperature, that's fine. They don't need to be the exact same temperature of your reef tank. Um, because these guys are also what we call urethermic, so they can tolerate wide ranges wide. of temperature, and they can they can tolerate a temperature shock like you wouldn't believe. I put tigger pods from 80 degrees Fahrenheit into 33 degrees Fahrenheit, and put them back after about 30 minutes. Totally no problem. Oh, that's they amazing. Survive. 
Um, and so very durable animals, and that's one of the reasons why we work with them, not, you know, not only their uses. Um, and so, so yeah, and then as far as adding pods routinely, it is a good idea. We, uh, our, our average customer that we speak with adds a bottle or two once a month. We have customers that add eight bottles a week. Um, yeah. And, you know, they're feeding multiple mandarins, dragon pi or pipefish, uh, seahorses. So they actually have it and they, and they don't want to grow these organisms. They don't want to deal with the culture. That They leave that to, up to us. Uh, yeah. and, and so, you know, these and, and we pr we're, we're commercial farmers for these organisms. We produce a, a lot of them. We overproduce them. And so we can we can we can meet any any demand, any need that anybody has. Okay. And of course, tech support, please reach out to us uh, and, and I can have these same exact conversations with anybody. Um, and, 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 you know, and help them out. So, yeah. Okay. So then I'm guessing uh, reefnutrition.com, if people want to buy something, check out their local fish store, see if they carry it as well. And then um, <clears throat> are you the one who answers on Instagram? So if people have a question or... So there's a couple of us, but I, I primarily, I do most of the answering of, of technical questions and same with Facebook um, on our Reed Mariculture and our Reef Nutrition pages. Uh, and, and I'm very, I, I love jumping in there as fast as I can. Of course, I don't jump in on weekends because weekends for are for family and for exercise and relaxation. Um, but I, I come in Monday morning and I'm typing away, answering away and let's, you know, and, and I love, I love touching base with customers. This was something that I, I cherished when I worked at pet stores, when I was in college, when I was a kid and helping people troubleshoot, testing water that I just, I love that. There's nothing better than, than talking with somebody about their tank. It's great. So, well, that's awesome. Well, I believe I have a shipment coming in Wednesday from you guys. I think yep. you shipped it today. So I've been busy this weekend setting up my refugium. It, it took a little longer than I thought, but I'm pretty excited about it. I got some macro algae in there. I got some miracle awesome. mud. I got some rubble rock. I got a, one of those new pod hotels I'm going to try. Yeah, nice. I'm, gonna just, I'm just going to try. I'm going to try it out. So I'm excited, and I definitely learned some tips today. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw that in there. Okay, well, I appreciate your time. We're approaching the 45-minute okay. Zoom limit because I, I, don't, I, I don't have the fancy Zoom account. So. Okay, perfect. <laughs> All right, yeah, well, you, great. You, you have a big work day, so I really appreciate it, Chad. Seriously, thank right you on, so Matthew. much. You're welcome. Right, we'll chat later. Okay. Adios. Right, bye.